lecture about the digital SAT. My name is Dave Gewertz, and I've been a professional tutor for the past 20 years or so, mostly focusing on SAT and ACT prep, uh, a little bit of everything else. I've done some math and science, uh, the GRE, the GMAT, the LSAT, everything but social studies. It's the one thing I don't know. Unfortunately, it's not on this test, so uh, I'm going to be okay in that department. Uh, I designed this lecture today just because every year we usually get uh, tons of questions from parents and students alike about uh, the SAT, when is it offered, what's on it, how should I prepare for it, how does the scoring work, what's a good score, and hopefully by the end of today we'll have a good amount of answers to most of those questions and then some, and hopefully we'll be able to leave with a nice action plan of how to get started on your quest for SAT mastery. Give a little overview of what we'll be discussing today. Uh, we'll be talking very broadly at first about the role of the SAT. Uh, why do we take it? How does it fit into the college admissions pie? Uh, we'll be talking about when the SAT is changing and what some of the new administrative requirements are going to be. From there, we'll talk about the scoring and how the scoring is going to be a little bit different in the way it used to be um, with adaptive testing. We'll talk about format and content changes. That's going to be the bulk of the second half of the lecture. And we'll finish up with uh, when you're going to want to start preparing, how to prepare, and some general guidelines and uh, resources at the end. We'll ask you to kindly hold any questions until the end of the lecture, and I'll happily go over any of those uh, at that point. And uh, we will mostly be focusing on the SAT today, but we will briefly touch on the ACT as well. Normally, for this lecture, I would love to do uh, differences between SAT and ACT, uh, but because the SAT is changing, there's a lot to talk about, so that's going to be the whole of today's lecture. But if you have more ACT questions, we can discuss those uh, at the end. Before we jump in, just to get a feel for some of the uh, participants in the room today, uh, how many students are juniors? Both juniors. Okay, that makes it pretty simple. So right in the thick of things, the third point, point four. Uh, you still have plenty of time to get started and get prepared for the tests that are coming up. And uh, we'll be showing you some kind of sample timelines if you're looking to start prepping now, or if you are going to be waiting more towards the fall, if you think the spring is going to be a bit crazy. So we'll talk more about that towards the end of today. So let's start very broadly with what is the SAT, just in case we aren't too familiar with it. And the SAT is a reasoning test that's going to test uh, your math, reading, and writing abilities. Uh, because it's a reasoning test, it's not a test that you can just study and memorize facts for and just kind of regurgitate them and get a good score. Um, while you can study and memorize certain things, there's going to be formulas, uh, algebra skills, punctuation rules, and some other grammar rules, you're still going to have to work on your ability to apply what you know to new situations. That's the reasoning part of the reasoning test. This is a test that you can improve at. It's not like you take it one time, you get a score, and that's it. You're locked in and you can't improve. That would be awful. Um, so it's not like an IQ test, which is supposed to be sort of like this flat measure of your intellectual ability, although there's a lot of controversy about that. Apparently, it's actually not a flat measure, and you can study and get better at those as well. Uh, so this does not really just tell you how smart you are. It's just one type of test. And the SAT is an important part of the admissions process. Emphasis on part. It's not the one true test that forever determines your fate and locks in your entire future. And to show how it kind of fits in with everything when you're applying to colleges, we have here what we call the admissions pie, uh, which we break down into sort of four sectors. The right side makes up the academic side of the pie. You've got your GPA, um, your average, and not just your average, but how difficult are the courses that you're currently taking. So colleges love to see that you're challenging yourself. They want to see that we're taking pre-calc, AP exams, honors classes. Um, they want to see you know, more than just the basic three years of math or science. So that factors in as well. Uh, they might even rather see you take a harder course and maybe have a slightly lower grade point average in that course to show that you can hang you know, with some of the more difficult curricula. The bottom right, we have test scores, which will either be SAT or ACT, uh, and potentially um, is everybody from the Hopog area, I'm guessing? Oh, yeah, do you guys take AP exams or IB exams? Usually, is it AP? Probably AP. You know, some schools do IB. Uh, either of those are just one way of taking sort of like a college-level course and getting credit for it. So that's something you might submit as well. 
the left side of the pie is where we get to show who we are as a person outside of the school uh, uh, domain. So we've got your activities like community service, uh, volunteer work, clubs and sports, if you work or do an internship, and any accomplishments in those domains. Then we've got your character, which you're going to be able to shine, uh, show her and have it shine through in your essay, hopefully, so that you're not just a pile of statistics and numbers. It's a chance to say who you are as a person, how you see the world, and show how you think. Teacher recommendations will show up here as well, and you might have to do an interview. Not most, most colleges won't require this, but if you're looking at some of the Ivy League schools, some of them may require an interview. As for which of these sectors are more important or less important, it depends on the schools that you're looking at. Some are gonna care a lot more about GPA and test scores. Other ones are gonna care a lot more about your essay and your extracurricular. So it just depends on the school from school to school. And in fact, some schools may not care at all about your test scores. We kind of live in a strange world today where we've probably all heard of the term test optional and thrown around a lot, more so since COVID first hit. And we want to take a moment to kind of talk about what that is, how it works, and some of the confusion that comes along with it. Unfortunately, it is a very confusing uh, situation. So even before COVID, uh, schools, some schools out there were test optional. What that meant was you didn't have to submit an SAT or ACT score. Uh, if you decide to do that, suddenly this part of the circle is gone. And that means that everything else gets a little bit bigger. They're going to look a lot more at your GPA, your AP exams, and uh, you know the character side of that circle. Um, supposedly, they claim that if you don't submit a score, it doesn't get held against you. It doesn't hurt your chances of getting in. Um, so this is a great opportunity if you struggle with test taking, if you find that um, you know you have a lot of anxiety during tests and your scores aren't really matching you know where your GPA is. Uh, you may not have to submit your scores. Um, having said that, schools that are test optional will encourage you to still send your scores if they're good. And they say that it can help you to get in if they're good. And this is very confusing. <laughs> this makes it kind of hard to know what should we do. And uh, this is why you can talk to some guidance counselors and they're going to say it's a good idea to try taking the SAT and uh, keep your options open because if you have a strong performance, it can give you an advantage or help you out when applying to certain schools. Uh, if you dig into some of the data, you might find, uh, the last I was looking at, it seemed like it was a little less than half of students were submitting to test optional schools. But if you start looking at some of the more competitive ones, you might find those numbers become higher. Uh, I know people that were doing early decision, that's the binding one, you say, I'm going here if you let me in. Uh, the amount of people that were submitting scores was dramatically higher, and some of them were even getting higher kind of odds of getting in. That doesn't mean that if you do it, you have a better odds of getting in, but it was correlated with having a better chance of getting in. So uh, confusing, but take the test, keep your options open, and you can decide what you do with your scores. Today. Taking the test also may open up academic scholarship opportunities that are related to SAT and ACT scores. And we're still kind of in a phase where we don't fully know what all the colleges are going to require at the end of this year. Most of them have put out policies that said for the next two or three years, we're going to be test optional. Um, a couple of schools already have said we're going to start requiring the SAT. I forget if it was, I think MIT might have been one. Uh, a couple other big schools said we're going to start to require it. I doubt that many of them are going to turn around and say, surprise, you need a score for the fall now. But um, you know, I guess being in 11th grade, you're probably going to be safe if most schools are going to be test optional for uh, for this year when you apply as well. So good to take it, keep your options open, and then you can decide what to do with that score later. The big question why we're here today is, is the SAT format changing soon? And the answer is yes. The test is becoming the digital SAT, sometimes called the DSAT for short. And this is not just the paper SAT on the digital format or on a computer. It's actually a different format, different types of questions, different timing. So this is why we have a whole talk tonight about what's going to be different on it and how the game's going to be changing a bit. You'll be taking this on a computer at a test center, which will probably be your school. You'll have to provide, uh, most likely you'll be providing your own device, but the school might have devices for you. Uh, did anybody take the digital PSAT? the beginning of this year? 
Okay, did you bring your own device or did you have to use one there? They gave you one, yeah. So this is something that's still kind of trying to see how it's going to play out since the college board's like, oh, you can bring your own device. And now schools are kind of saying like, yeah, that's not going to fly. So. Well, I'm not going to make you them all devices. Right, and they're probably going to require like the, uh, like, a, was it like a Chromebook or something like that. Yeah, they might make you bring your school match Chromebook. So we'll talk more about that on here, but uh, the things that we're going to say may or may not be true as the schools kind of go off their policies. Um, so let's actually uh, talk about the when. Uh, the last paper SAT was offered in December of 2023. And as of March, the next SAT, uh, March 2024, the SAT will be entirely of the digital format going forward. There is a paper exam that exists out there. Uh, it's a paper version of this, but you can't take it unless you have certain uh, special needs or requirements. For, so for the majority of the country, they'll be taking the uh, digital test. And if you took the PSAT this year, probably it was the digital version of it. And uh, now that there's still plenty of opportunities to try to practice this out. So what do we actually need to take this test? Uh, like the paper test, you're gonna need your ID, admission ticket, pencils, and uh, calculator. Uh, you do get scrap paper during the exam, so having something to write with is very really helpful. And uh, I think they can give you as much scrap paper as you require. As for the tech stuff, uh, depending on where you take it and what the school's policies are, if they let you bring your own device, you may be able to bring uh, a laptop or a tablet, um, which you'll need to make sure it's fully charged and has an app installed. And you may be able to bring a mouse uh, or a keyboard, depending on the device you have and a charging cable, which is recommended. A lot of specific tech stuff on here, which we don't want to bore you too much with, but basically for uh, a laptop, you can either bring a uh, Windows or a Mac laptop. Um, an iPad or Windows tablet is allowed, and only a school-managed Chromebook, you cannot bring a personal one. So if the school does give you one of those, that's probably what they might want you to, have to bring in the test. And then the tech requirements on the bottom, which we won't bore you with, all available on the College Board website. Uh, the one thing that we'll mention is for the uh, all the devices, you're allowed to bring a mouse. Uh, I personally like using a mouse and a keyboard whenever I'm using a computer. I have fat fingers. I'm not a fan of touch screens, uh, but you guys know yourself, so whatever you're comfortable with is fine. Uh, as for a keyboard, you can only use keyboards for, um, I believe, an iPad or Windows tablet. You can't use one for the Chromebook, and you can't use one for, uh, if you have a laptop, I mean, it should have a keyboard on it. Um, but if it doesn't, I don't believe you can bring one for it. Let me check uh, to see what the requirements are for that. Power is recommended to bring. College Board recommends you have a device that can last three to four hours. That's longer than the actual test, just because you got it set up and it might take some time and you would have a little bit of a buffer in there. Uh, they recommend to bring a charging cable, but a charging outlet is not guaranteed. Every room will have a certain amount of charging uh, stations available but it's not one-to-one. -one. So if there's 20 students in there, there might only be five to 10 outlets. That's gonna be different based on the test center. Uh, but if you do bring a cable and you have an issue, at least you know, you charge up. So I would recommend to bring that. Uh, the Blue Book app is required to take the test. This is an app you will download on your device before going to take the test. Uh, if you're at a center that already is providing computers for you, they'll have this installed ready to go. And if for some reason you forget, I'm sure everyone will be fully prepared. Uh, you can, they'll, they'll be able to set this up for you to get there. I think you can check in a few days before, up to five days before the exam. This is also the same app you'll use to do practice before you take the test. They have a couple of exams available, which we'll remind you of later. My keyboards we've already recommended. I usually prefer a wired mouse. There's gonna be a lot of wireless devices messing around in the room and that can cause some interference. And you don't have to worry about a battery if you have it uh, plugged in with a USB cable. And if you're using a tablet, if you can, uh, having a keyboard might be helpful for typing in some of the bad answers. You might be wondering what happens if you have a problem with your computer. And fortunately, there should be some things to help us out if there's an issue. So supposedly, every tech center will have a technology monitor, which is a person who can uh, help out with tech problems. And they have a help room as well. So uh, fortunately, the test is designed where if you have an issue during the test, which you'll be taking through Wi-Fi, uh, let's say your Wi-Fi cuts out. The test keeps running on your computer locally, and the timer is still going. So it doesn't mean that suddenly you're screwed and the timer is off and you're going to be in trouble. 
Uh, once you reconnect, it'll just upload whatever wherever you are to the server, so you can keep taking the test until you get the connection back. Same thing if your device shuts off. Uh, I believe the exam will be paused, and whenever you're able to get your power back, you're right back at where the time was before. So it's not like you're losing the time if your computer dies. So you don't have to go in fearing that some tech problem might happen and it's going to ruin the test. Uh, I'm sure something can go wrong if anything can, but uh, at least those issues are covered, which is nice. If you don't have the computer, there's a couple things you can do. You can borrow something one from your friend or family member. Um, you can see if the school will allow you to, to bring one, to give you one or to let you borrow one, or some schools may actually be providing them themselves. And you can actually go to College Board and ask for a computer as well. If you're going to do that, you have to do it at least 30 days in advance. So you want to make sure that you do that well ahead of time. And they said that you'll probably get a Chromebook. It could be a tablet or something else, but uh, that's what they play. So there should be something that you can get to use. Next, we're going to talk a bit about the actual scoring of the test. If you are familiar with the paper SAT, uh, the overall scoring has not changed. So the overall score is on a scale from 400 to 1,600 points. So if you show up and slip into a fear-induced coma, you still get to walk out with 400 points, which is great. Uh, but it's still kind of like getting a zero, so we might do better than that if you can. Uh, the 1,600 points splits up into two halves. We have a math score from 200 to 800 points and a reading and writing score. And while the scoring is, is similar, uh, a bit of a difference from the paper test, before the reading and the writing were two separate sections and they kind of got mishmashed together to give you a score. Now the reading and writing are blended into the same section. So you'll be doing both reading and writing questions in the same section and uh, they'll be worth an equal number of points and eventually that will get you your score out of uh, an 800. <clears throat> When you get your scores back, you'll get something like this. It'll have your total score in the middle, and then it'll have the breakdown of how you do math versus reading and writing. And the thing that's helpful there to see how did you do compared to the rest of the country is the percentile number that's on the right. And there will be a bunch of other um, subcategories here where they'll tell you how you do on like algebra versus advanced math. I find it's not the most helpful because it's so broad. Like you might see, oh, I got more questions wrong on geometry and trigonometry, but what? There's like a million different topics you might encounter from those two subjects. So it only gives you an idea of where you might want to look around and kind of explore, but it won't tell you like you got to work on Dagger and Deer or Sobatel or something like that. That you'll have to kind of see in some of the ones you're getting wrong. As for this question, which is a very popular one we get, what's a good score? I unfortunately can't give you an answer. There is no passing or failing on this test. There is no good or bad score. It just depends on where you want to go to school. That's going to determine what's good or bad for you. I can't tell you how most of the country does, and that's going to involve these percentiles. So um, the 50th percentile is, for example, means that you have done better than 50% of the country, and 50% of the country has done better than you. This is also the average score for the test. A 75th percentile means you did better than 75% of the country, and only 25% did better than you, and so on and so forth. So 90th percentile, you're beating most of the country. As for what correlates to those percentiles on the SAT, there's a lot of numbers on here, but we'll try to briefly summarize some of the key ones. The 50th percentile, that's the average score on the digital SAT, is around 10 or it's going to be about 520 and 520 on the two subjects. So anything above that means you're doing better than the average uh, grades in the country, uh, which is nice. 75th percentile is going to be around 1,200, um, and the 90th percentile is around 1,350. Sometimes people hear this scale and they see it's out at 1,600. I want a 1,500. I want a 1,450. That sounds really high. Not to say that you can't get that, but only like 5% of the country is getting above a 1430. Uh, it's pretty tough to score up in that, uh, that upper echelon of the exam. Um, so yeah, anywhere that's above average is a great place to start. Above that 1200 marker is going to open up several doors to many different schools. Uh, but again, that just depends on what's on your radar and what you're looking for. This is just the breakdown by subject for the percentiles, but it's pretty similar between math and reading. Uh, slight differences between them, but not much. So what score do colleges want? Uh, before we answer that, we can try to tell you where you might be able to find that on a college website, but uh, it can be 
difficult because it's in one of several different areas that you have listed here. You might find this information under about best facts, incoming freshmen, uh, FAQ, student profile. There's many areas that this will pop up. What you're looking for is either the average, the median, or the mid 50% for incoming freshmen, the SAT and ACT scores. Uh, this is an example of the mid 50% for Binghamton, which is between a 1290 and a 1450. And what that means is the middle 50% of students score in that range. The lower number, the 1290, is the 25th percentile. You did better than 25% of the students. And the upper number, the 1450, is the 75th percentile, which means you did better than 75% of the students. To be worth submitting, you probably will want to be somewhere in the middle of that, if not above. And that's something you can talk with the guidance counselor about, but they're going to tell you, you know, if the score isn't kind of at or above uh, whatever their average score is, it's probably not worth submitting, depending on the school. If it's a school that has a very high average and you're at the average, it might be worth submitting it to say, hey, I can still hang with the average student at this school in terms of their test scores. Here we've got a list of a bunch of different schools and their score ranges. This is from the paper SAT, so the big disclaimer, this might change as we go into the world of the digital SAT, but it should be somewhere around here. If there's a range, that's the mid 50%, and down here there's a couple averages. And it's great when you're looking into colleges to not just say, I want a 1550 and I want to go to Harvard, but let me look at a couple of different tiers of schools. Like where can I go with an 1100? And what schools want a 1200? So we don't put too much pressure on ourselves. And it's great to look wherever you are. So if you're right now, you're at 1100, start by looking at schools that have an average score of 1100. Then you can see, what can I get into with a 1200 or who is looking for 1300? This can get so you don't put too much pressure on yourself. Big question you get, how does it scoring work if you take the test multiple times? Uh, we've got two policies. One is called score choice. The other one is called uh, super score. Score check, score choice lets you take the test multiple times and then choose which of those scores you would like to set. So if the first time you take it is a disaster, it never happened. You don't have to submit that score. You can submit uh, the second or the third test that you took if that's your best. Most schools are gonna do that for the SAT and for the ACT, which encourages you to take the test multiple times. Super scoring is even better than that. This allows you to take, let's say, your best math score from one test and your best verbal score from another test and put them together to get a super score. We'll show an example in a moment. Most schools will do this for the SAT, which is great. And maybe about half, less than half, it's hard to give a number, do this for the ACT. It's not as widespread for the ACT. Um, the best thing you can do if you're not sure is call an admissions office of the school you're looking at and just ask them because it could be hard to find on the website uh, and they'll be able to tell you what their policy is. Here's a quick example. We have a student who took the SAT three times. January was not their best performance. It was their worst one. We don't send that score. It never happened. Their best verbal score is on March. Best math net score is in May. We send both of those tests, and our super score actually will increase by 20 points when we kind of staple those two together. And the colleges do not hold those lower numbers against you. They're not going to say, hey, why did you get that 580 on the, uh, the math section there? That's the most suspicious. It's not held against you. So again, you're encouraged to take your test multiple times to try to get that super score up. Great feature of the test. This is a good question that I don't technically know the answer to, but I can guess. Uh, can you super score the paper SAT with the digital? So if you already took the paper test, can you do this? Maybe. It's going to depend on the school. Uh, in the past, when the SAT changed format, some schools did do this, where they said, hey, we'll take your old SAT and your new SAT and look at the best of both. So um, if schools do do that, and you have a paper SAT score, that's awesome. That can only help you. Um, College Board is saying, based on their data, that the old test and the new test scores correlate, which is a good chance that schools will let you super score them. But we might not know this for a couple of months as schools put their policies out for the fall applications. Um, that's the summary of that right there. So, how many times should you take the test? Uh, based on super scoring and score choice, two to three times is a good recommendation. I like three is sort of the sweet spot. Just because with anything, whether it's a test or a sport or a 
performance of play, we're not going to be our best all the time. And because of that, it's good to give yourself multiple opportunities. You don't want to put pressure on yourself to take this once and knock it out of the park. Sometimes it happens, and it's great when it does, but for most people, it's going to be the second or third time where you do your best. So it's good to prepare for that. And uh, again, you never have to be fully prepared for this test. No one is ever fully prepared. If you're fully prepared, you're already getting 1600s. Go in, take it, get a score, and then try to see if you can do better next time and take some of that pressure off having to be fully prepared and be ready for uh, the exam. Quick sip, and then we'll jump into the new uh, formatting for the uh, digital test. A lot of numbers up here, which we'll try to summarize. Um, the digital and paper SAT are still the same number of sections. There's still four sections on it, two math and two verbal. Uh, big difference, there are way less questions on this test, which is good. It's less thinking, less work we have to do, less endurance required. Uh, for the verbal, it's almost half the number of questions, which is huge. And the math's about a quarter, 25% uh, less questions than before. Because of that, the time on this test, the length of the test is less, which is great. It used to be three hours, now it's two hours and 15 minutes. That might still sound awful, but it's definitely better than three hours on Saturday. Uh, so we'll take it. They used to have an experimental section at the end of the test, which didn't count. They have a couple questions that probably was testing for future exams. That's gone. What they do is they sprinkle a couple of questions in throughout the test. They have two questions on every module that don't count, and you don't know which ones they are. So when you get your score back later, oh, I guess seven didn't count, or ten didn't count. Um, so that'll be on every uh, every exam. Time per question has gone up, which is great. You've got a little bit more time uh, per question on a math and reading. The drawback is you're on a computer and that might slow you down when you're reading and trying to uh, process information. I think overall though, because of that extra time for question, it probably balances out. So no major changes then to the uh, time of that, which is good. One of the big differences formatting wise is the way this test is scored. So not the actual scoring scale, that's the same 1600 scale, but the old test, the paper SAT was called a linear exam, which meant you all take the same test, the same questions are on it. If you get this many right, you get this score. It's all pretty much locked in. The digital SAT is multi-stage adaptive testing. That sounds terrifying, but basically means there is more than one stage. There's two modules you get per subject, and the test adapts to how you're doing. So if you do well, it gets harder. Very weird. So module one has a mix of easy, medium, and hard questions. Let's say you do really well on it, you have a strong performance. The second module, you get more hard questions and less easier questions. You might think that's terrible, I don't want that, but you do because your maximum score is going to be higher. If you have a rough run on that first module having poor performance, the second module will be easier, lots more easy questions and less hard questions. Your maximum score, though, will be lower. That is not good. You do not want the second easy section. Depends on where you're aiming for a score, but you'll see that in a moment. You might be wondering, well, how many do I need to get right in order to get that second high difficulty section? And we can't give a specific number because it's going to change from test to test. Uh, from playing around with the practice test they have uh, available and manually entering a million answers and then seeing how many we got right and trying to figure this out, we found a few break points of, uh, for each subject in terms of how many you need to get right. And I'll share a couple of those insights. So this is from, I think, practice test one. So again, this number will be different for other tests. On the verbal, 27 questions, you had to get 19 right to get access to the harder second section. Um, and if you didn't, let's say you got 18 right, and then you got everything right on the easy second section, your score could not go above the 600. This is the cap if you get the easy second section. You just can't get above that. That might change on a different test, but it seems to be 550, 650. You can't beat that if you don't get the second part section, which is interesting. Uh, the math has a similar pattern, except uh, less questions, so 22 questions. It seemed to be about 16 right got the hard second section. And similarly, if you got the easy second section and completely dominated it, 
You can't get above a 550. So getting that card section is going to be key if you're gunning for 650, 700. Um, you'll have to get more of those first section uh, questions correct. I'm sure over time, people are going to data mine the test and probably run a bunch of software and things like that to really figure out what's going on in the algorithm. I found generally one more right is about 10 to 20 points. That's all I can really say. Uh, but I'm sure we'll get more info as people dig around and figure that out. As we go. As for the structural differences, we have a couple of them. Uh, the first might seem kind of obvious. It's on a computer. Now, that does have pros and cons, which we should point out. Uh, there actually are a bunch of pros to taking a test on a computer. It's a lot easier to mark and flag answers or questions you want to go back to. It's actually a button. You press it, it puts a little flag on it. And then there's another button that brings up a screen of every question you've answered. And you can see all the flags there. And you can say, oh, I put a flag on number five. And boom, you go right back to number five. Pretty cool. They also make it very easy to uh, put your answers in. You just click your answer and you're done. Before you had to actually bubble in your answers on that bubble sheet. And how many of us have had a horror moment where we copied an answer wrong and we were so upset because, uh, yeah, it happens to everybody. But it probably won't happen here because you don't have to do that, which is nice. So I think that's a good feature of the test. Another great feature, we have Desmos on this exam. Has anybody used Desmos in math before? If you haven't, it's a really awesome app that's built in, kind of like you guys have, a, I guess, a TI-83 or 84 or something like that. It's similar to that. You can do all types of uh, math on there, but it's really, really good with graphing, and you can solve a lot of questions with it if you know how to kind of hack them. This is going to become a key thing in uh, preparing for the test. If you don't want to learn math, you can learn how to just master Desmos and get a lot of questions right. So that's a huge thing. Mastering Desmos is a huge thing that can help you a lot on this test. There is a built-in clock. There'll be a timer ticking at the top, which could be good if it terrifies you. You can hide it, which is nice. So you can make it go away and bring it up when you need to keep track of time. A couple cons. Uh, the first is that, like we mentioned before, people tend to read and process information slower on a computer. This could be a problem and something you'll have to see how it affects you. Not everyone will be the same. I also find it's not easy to highlight and to take notes. They do have a highlight feature for the reading section, so you can highlight, but you have to like highlight it, click highlight, enter a note, then in the notes hidden, then you could like scroll over it to see, it's sort of a mess. So for most of my students, I'm gonna tell them, you have scrap paper, just write notes on there. Uh, and that's a little annoying. It's also annoying when you wanna do math because they give you this beautiful diagram of a triangle, and now you can't write on it. You have to redraw it. You got to copy the info, and then you can finally get to work on it. So that's something that um, is a little annoying on the test. But I think with that increased time for questions, it should balance out. Another big difference: the number of uh, the way the test has uh, standalone questions or not. The paper SAT would give you a big reading or writing passage, and then 10, 11 questions on it uh, related to that passage. Math. A couple questions maybe would be related on a single grammar chart. The digital SAT, every question is discrete, which means it's got nothing to do with the question after it or the question before, it, which is probably a good thing. If you've got a tough reading passage and you really struggle with understanding it, you might get crushed on five or six of those questions because the comprehension wasn't there. Now, if you get a tough passage on the reading, there's only one question that goes with it, but you probably get that question all and hopefully the next passage isn't as hard. So I think this is a good thing. But for some people, maybe it's challenging having to keep changing gears on each passage of what they're reading. Topics are better organized on the digital SAT. The paper test, the topics were all randomized. On the digital test, the reading and writing are grouped by topic, which is nice. That lets you get a nice rhythm going. You'll see like four or five transition questions, four or five punctuation questions, then you might have a couple of verb questions. So that's cool that you can kind of get that rhythm going. The math, though, is still the wild west. It's all over the place. This difficulty pattern, the College Board claimed existed, and then I don't know if it actually does. So <laughs> we have to see if this is actually true. But on the paper test, there wasn't really much of a difficulty pattern on the reading and writing. And now they were claiming that within each topic, the questions would get harder. So if you've got four transition questions, the last one there should be hard. And then the first punctuation should be easy and it should keep climbing up. 
Then I saw something saying that they're not doing that, so I don't know if that's actually true. I have seen some of them sort of following that pattern, but um, we will see. If it does do that, that's great. Then you have more uh, predictability of what you're going to be encountering that makes it a little easier to know which ones you might want to get. So hopefully they do do this and that that does the truth. Let's talk about the content differences. And I find that the reading is where we're going to have the most dramatic differences between paper SAT and digital SAT. So this is paper SAT, a giant passage of about 80 to 100 lines, 10 to 11 questions. This is digital SAT. Paragraph, about 150 words, and a single question. That's it. So you are not reading very widely. You are reading very densely. It's much denser here, and you're only really dealing with three sentences or so, maybe four sentences in a paragraph. So it's sort of a different muscle here. Um, the first few runs through this, having people who have done the paper SAT come in here, they would come in and just read right through this, and I'd be like, okay, what'd you read? And they'd say, I have no idea. <laughs> and that's a big problem, because you've only got three sentences to interpret. So here, kind of reading, pausing, thinking, interpreting a bit, looking for relationships between sentences is going to become way more important. And uh, the vocabulary as well might be a little bit more challenging, but it was tough on the old test as well. But yeah, the length is such a, is a big thing. So the rhythm and the length is, is one of the largest changes that we'll see. Another big difference is on the digital SAT is a new question site called the sentence completion. These have existed on old versions of the SAT way back when, um, and they are back, and they exist on some other exams uh, that are out there as well. What it is, is you have a paragraph with a blank in there, and you have to pick the best word to put into that blank. So it's not just vocabulary, it's also reading and understanding the context around that blank, and how does it relate to the blank that's there. It's a bit of both. But the vocab could be words like discernible, repudiates, recant, unobtrusive, or innocuous. And at some point, if you don't know some of those words, you might be dead. Which means vocabulary is now way more important than it was on the paper SAT. It always was important. I used to do vocab with my students. I had a couple lists. But now we're doing roots. We're doing prefixes. We're doing suffixes. We've got lists of vocab. We're defining stuff we encounter we don't know. Um, there's a lot more work you're going to need to put in the vocab. But it will pay off because of the number of questions on it. It's about 20% of the reading writing test, about 10 questions. So. I would say not a great thing that that's here. It's more work you're going to have to do for both. One great thing we have, though, it's not all going to be doom and gloom. Uh, the evidence questions are gone from the paper SAT. There are questions on the new one that they call evidence, but they're not like this. The old ones would have a question, you'd answer it, and then they'd say, hey, what line number proves the answer to the previous question? And these were pretty hard. A lot of students struggled on these, and they're gone because every question now is standalone and never will have anything to do with the one before. I used to be 20% of the paper SAT, so this is a net positive. Vocab in context is not entirely gone, but effectively it's way, way less. It's basically gone. Uh, the paper SAT had several questions that say, hey, what does this word mean in this line? And I like these a lot. They're very short questions. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily easy, but with some right tactics and strategy, not too bad. And there are about 10 on the paper SAT now, maybe one or two, because they kind of became those sentence completions. So I think that's a negative because that's a little more sophisticated, uh, became a little bit more challenging. A positive, the American history passage is gone. Paper SAT had one passage that would have this big historical document, uh, usually from a primary source, so it could be like a speech Abe Lincoln gave, a letter Thomas Jefferson wrote to someone. And this is something that was written three hundred, you know, two, three hundred years ago. And the language is tough. It's very uh, old and, and uh, very formal. And students often struggled on it. Gone. It doesn't mean social studies is gone, but no primary text like that. You might get someone talking about an event history, like a historian. Um, so that's a great thing. I find that a lot of the questions on the digital SAT really challenge you to make inferences, and that's challenging. Inferences are not the easiest question types. 
the test calls some of these something else. They call them evidence, but they're all pretty much making an inference. One of the types involves, uh, they might have a passage and then say, which of the following, if true, would most directly support the student's claim? And they could say what would support an, a, a hypothesis, a suggestion. They might ask what weakens the claim in the passage. Not an easy type. You first have to find or figure out what was the claim. And then you have to think what could possibly make that claim stronger. So none of these things are in the passage. You have to kind of connect them to that claim and either back it up or weaken it, depending on the question. These might be hard for students, and there's a bunch of them. There might be four to eight of them. Maybe even up to 10, uh, there's usually a bunch for tests. Another inference type, uh, this the SAT actually does call inference, is a text conclusion. You have a paragraph and a blank at the end. Then you have to choose what most logically completes the text. Um, so you kind of have to understand the main idea of the text, and they often require you to understand the relationship of sentences, as we said earlier, that's a big part of this test. So this could be a hard question type for students, and there's a bunch of these as well. You might get four to eight of these uh, on the exam as well. So these could be tough. Lastly, there's a new type of passage you might be dealing with, a poem. And you might get one to three of these. And this felt like it kind of replaced those American history ones with tough language, because you could get some very uh, artsy language in here that's not super concrete, and you may have to understand what the main idea of that poem was. Fortunately, there's only a few of these, so if these are hard for you, there's a lot of other stuff you could work on. I wouldn't really focus on it, but these might be tough for some people. Putting that into a big perspective of pros and cons, the big pros, shorter passages, I think, is a good thing. Single questions per passage, no more evidence pairs, no more historical documents, which is great. And uh, the, the questions are grouped by topic as well. So you have a bunch of inference, then a bunch of uh, broad questions, and they'll kind of go by topic, which is a good thing. The big cons, way more vocab to work on, more inference questions. Vocab and context kind of got replaced by sentence completion, which I think is a little bit tougher, and uh, a couple of those poems with tough language. So hard to say where this is going to land for students. Some people might be better with a short passage, some people might struggle with vocabulary. You won't really know until maybe, maybe ask me again in a year after going through a bunch of uh, uh, sessions with students to see uh, how they did on this compared to the paper as they did. As for the writing portion of the reading and writing section, uh, it's gotten a lot simpler, which is great. There's a lot less question types on it. The old paper SAP had wordiness, logic, relevancy, uh, parallelism, commonly confused words. Pretty much all of that stuff is gone. That's a lot less topics you have to prepare for and learn about. Now it's pretty much these core five topics. And they might do like parallelism or modifier or something like that. But punctuation is king. It's the most popular type on the writing questions, which could be good or bad, depending on how strong you are in punctuation. The good thing is it's a very studyable skill. You can learn comma rules, semicolon rules, when do I use an apostrophe, when do I use a dash? So uh, if you're willing to do that work and you work on those rules, uh, you can get better stuff. Transitions have always been important on the SAT and they're back. They're also a very powerful foundation for reading. And so it's something that you'll want to focus on pretty early because it also helps your understanding of ideas and passage. Verbs are back, sentence, uh, subject verb agreement and tense are gonna be on the exam. And a new type of question that for now I'm just calling it research because they give you a bunch of bullets that a student has researched on a topic. Then they give you some kind of purpose. It says, the student wants to present the study and its findings. What choice uses the relevant intro from those bullets to do that? It's a bit of a hybrid. You first have to understand what's the purpose, and then you have to understand what's relevant. This might be good or bad for students, depending on how you, uh, how you, how you feel about them. I found at first they were a little tricky. I might have gotten tricked up on a couple of them. And after kind of seeing some patterns and learning some strategy on my own for it, uh, they became a lot better. So I think if the right, if the right coaching uh, and the right technique, you can make them a lot easier. Uh, but they could be tough for people. And there's usually a bunch of things about eating them for test. So pros, way less topics to learn and master. No more logic purpose and deletes. Questions are arranged by topic as well, so they go usually transitions, uh, then you might get punctuation, whatever way around. 
Uh, and then four short passages and single questions. You have to use big text and new questions as well. The column may not be a con for you, but if you're weak with punctuation, and most students I've found can be because uh, if they don't do punctuation on the New York State Regents, a lot of teachers don't teach it. So if you don't have that background, then it could be tough. Um, and those research questions might be a little challenging. But again, I think that'll get better once you do a bunch of it. As for the math, the math I found to be the most similar to the paper SAT. So if you have seen or done any paper SAT math questions, uh, there isn't too much difference on this exam, which is great. The big difference we mentioned is you get Desmos built into the actual app for the entire exam. It's a little window you can pop up that looks something like this, and you can type in equations, you can solve stuff, you can grab, uh, but you can also use your uh, trusty TI 8384. I'd probably say uh, both will be really good. For calculating stuff, probably use a calculator, and whenever you want to do graphing things, I'd say Des Desmos is probably better. And you get the calculator for the whole test now. The paper SAT had a no calculator section that's gone. So calc for the whole exam is sweet. That's why this guy is already on the side. <laughs> We've got some shorter word problems as well. Um, they're still long, so it's not it's not going to be like super short, but uh, this is a, an example of a worst offender from the paper SAT, which is a pretty big piece of the question. And this is one of the worst offenders I've seen on a digital SAT. And it's a lot shorter. There's a couple less lines in there. So they did make an effort to reduce the word count to back questions, which is a good thing for sure. I found that data analysis was kind of gone from the digital SAT. It's not gone, but it was a big part of the paper SAT. Questions with charts and graphs, and you have to analyze them. Sometimes a couple of questions on one chart. Uh, they don't really have those. They have like geometry graphing, like slope, midpoint, distance stuff on the test, but uh, these are not as popular. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. They're just not really careful. As for uh, the topics or the big topics, a lot of them are still the same. Algebra is king, it's always been king, it's the most popular topic on the test. Uh, graphing and geometry are both still around and both important. And there's a few little ins and outs that have happened, which we won't dive too much into, but they seem to have a system of inequalities a lot. Uh, they don't seem to be asking the remainder theorem, so little things like that are swapped, but that's something you don't really get to from the end of your preparation anyway. Overall, mostly uh, pros for the math exam, uh, shorter work problems, um, less uh, multiple or no multiple questions related to a chart or graph. Calculator for the whole test and Desmos, which is a very powerful app to allow you to solve things graphically. The big con is really just you're taking math on a computer. Like we said earlier, you're, you got to draw and recopy everything to get started on a question. You can't just like highlight or underline things in a question. You didn't have to use your scrap for. So that's kind of annoying. But beyond that, nothing really got worse on the math. So I think that's a good thing. That's it for the content. We'll talk more about the administrative stuff when the test is offered, when to prepare, how to prepare to finish up the lecture. Uh, we've got a nice little chart here showing the uh, times of year both tests are offered for SAT and for ACT. SAT and ACT both are offered three times in the spring. Uh, they're both offered once in the summer, but the ACT is not in New York in July. And it's only not in the Europe, which I have no idea why it doesn't make any sense, uh, but it's just not. Maybe one day we'll figure that out. The SAT is in August, but it's limited, so it might be hard to take. There's only like three or four schools in the round offer. I wouldn't bank on being able to take that one. It might fill up. But if you are going to take that, definitely keep an eye on when they open up registration and sign up as soon as you can. In the fall, we've got three chances of both tests. And if you're going into senior year, it depends on if you're doing early applications for regular applications. Regular applications, November tends to be the cutoff for the SAT. You can probably take the December one. You'll have to score back for deadline, uh, the deadline for applications, but it cuts it kind of close and guys might get scared of that. For the ACT, October is usually the last one that you'll take. If you're doing early admissions, the last one you'll take for the SAT is usually October. Uh, you'll get that back just in time. The ACT is usually September. So again, it just depends on uh, which type of application you're doing. Usually, if you are trying to still improve your score and you're getting close to like early admissions, I would say like take more time and do regular admissions and get your score up. You don't want to submit an application that you don't think is the best thing to be. 
job. If you're torn between that, take more time and try to get a better score, I would say. Scores come back about two weeks after these. You have about 10 to 13 days for SAT and about 10 days for ACT. Changes on the test, but that's a good rule of thumb. As for when you should start preparing, uh, probably now, uh, since we're in 11th grade, usually beginning to middle of 11th grade is a great time to start. You want to give yourself up to a maximum of about four months ahead of whatever test you're going to be taking. If you're looking at that March SAT that's coming in two months, that's still okay. You're not, you're not uh, too late to be doing that. Uh, but it may take more time beyond that to kind of get through more material and get to the level you want to be at. So it's better just to give yourself more time. Try to avoid times of year where you have sports, uh, heavy commitments to clubs, you have a theater thing going on or some kind of play. Uh, it's just going to be crazy to try to add basically an extra class into your schedule on top of your already busy life. For some people, that might be the summer. I have students that are in sports all year, and they're like, the only time like, I'm not crazy busy is in the summer, and like that's when you're prepping. You're going to prep in the summer and take the test in the fall. It's not really to do that. You have two shots of the best install, so that's an option if the spring is going to be great. And definitely try to avoid the May SAT if you're taking AP exams because it's right around the same time and it could be great. That's up to you. Some people are fine with that. I've had students who've had breakdowns and came home crying because they had two minute tests in like two or three days and they burned out. So you know yourself in your limits, but be warned. We're probably around here uh, trying to come up with which tests you want to take. Um, if you're looking to jump in pretty soon to either the March SAT or the April SAT, and you're not sure which one to do, take a test of each. That's the best thing you can do. You can speculate all day what's going to be better, what's going to be worse. You don't know until you try them. They have free exams you can take both. You can always, you can always shoot me an email. I'd be happy to tell you where to go or I can send you some exams. And that'll help you decide which one looks better. And then you're going to want to jump in and start prepping for them. So this is someone who is prepping for an ACT for the spring. You would start around December or January, take the ACT in April and in June. And if you need to, you've got the fall for an extra shot at the test. If you're doing the SAT starting now, you'd probably be looking to take the March exam, maybe the May one, depending on APs, and then June, and if you need to, October or November and fall. But it's great to try to just have a nice run at it and be done within a couple of months. It's not the best if you have to take two months off in the summer and you can learn a bunch of stuff. People do it, but it's great if you can just kind of, you know, have a good solid run, take a few times, and then that's it. As for how you should prepare, we've got a couple of options, uh, the most basic of which is to wing it, which is not recommended. But that's great when you're taking a practice test for getting a baseline score. So if you haven't done uh, either an SAT or ACT, it is fine to just take one, maybe just look at the timing and the directions before taking it and just get a score. From there, you've got self-study, review classes, and one-on-one -on -one tutoring as your three main options for how to prepare. Self-study can be very effective. It's definitely the most affordable option of the three. You might buy a book. Maybe you get some kind of self-paced online course or something like that, and that's it, and you just get to it. Uh, you have the most flexible schedule because you set your own hours for when you're going to study. You don't have to show up to a class uh, that's going to be a certain time each week. And there's a decent amount of materials available. Right now, for official materials, it is a little tough. That's going to be tough for any of these categories. The digital SAT has put out four full practice tests, and that's it. <laughs> there's some other stuff floating around. There's like a pool of questions, but... You know, that's good if you just want to practice some stuff, but not there's not many actual uh, official practice tests you can take. There's a lot of third-party stuff, though. There's Princeton Review, there's Kaplan, there's Barron's. They're okay. Like, I might even be using some myself for tutoring just because we don't have enough materials of the official stuff. But sometimes the questions are a little too easy, a little too hard, or they don't feel the same as they would. But they'll still be pretty solid for getting most people prepared for the test. Um, the big cons for this are there's no accountability. It's just you and yourself. So you're going to need to be very highly uh, motivated and organized if you're going to do this. But again, it can be effective if you're able to do that. Um, so you have to say, okay, three times a week, these times I'm going to sit for an hour, I'm going to come to the library, and I'm going to do some work. And to do that, you can be successful. You don't have anyone to help here other than the internet which can be pretty good, I mean, YouTube, and uh, there's plenty of websites that will give you information to help get through some tough topics. And the books do have explanations and things, but if you ever hit a wall with that, 
there's nobody there to, to answer that, unfortunately. So uh, again, this could be a great way to start if you're not looking to commit to a big class or a tutoring program and just see where you land. And then you could always go to jump into one of those if you still need some extra improvement. Classes can be very effective for getting a nice overview of an exam, learning some key strategies, going over some of those skills you haven't seen in a year or two, got some how to learn geometry skills, uh, and it's definitely going to be more affordable than doing one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Um, so they can be very effective as well. You get a teacher, you can answer questions, hopefully within and without outside of class. And you'll usually get a bunch of test prep materials, more books and exercises and things like that. The cons of classes is it's usually a one pace fits all approach. I've taught several classes myself, and there's not a lot of wiggle room. But today we're doing uh, how to graph uh, parabolas and circles. We're going to show one or two examples, and then we're on to the next thing because it's just too much to cover. Obviously, there's some wiggle room where we maybe can show an extra example or explain something, but if you want to just do math, uh, the class is doing math reading and writing. You're not going to be able to just do the subject that you want. Um, so you don't get that uh, individual focus, unfortunately. You also don't get individualized attention. Uh, a class can be anywhere from 10 to 20 students. And sure, the teacher knows you and has a, an idea of your ability from your, you answering questions, but they don't get to really like watch you do that or hear you think out loud as you're reading and really troubleshoot like what's going wrong, are you following the methods and things like that. Um, most classes will have homework, but they may not have time to go over it. Most of the classes I've taught, it's go do this homework. Here's where you can look over the explanations and that's it. Cause the, again, there's just too much to cover. Maybe we try to sneak in review of a couple of them, but uh, that requires a good amount of motivation. It also requires a good amount of focus. The class can be two to three hours, which is long. Um, and if you know that that sounds horrifying to you and that you might pass out uh, 45 minutes into the first hour, the class is not gonna work for you. And if you can handle that and you've got the motivation of class can get you some very success in your preparation. Last, we've got one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And being a tutor, of course, I will be biased to say it's probably the best one, but it just, it's just one-on-one. -on -one. It's going to give you uh, more insight and more customizability than uh, a class or uh, going solo with. But there are cons to it as well. It's more expensive than a class, and it's definitely more expensive than just trying to self-study. It also can have some difficulties in terms of scheduling, but tutors are hard to find, and they usually have very limited uh, availability. I myself will have up to 10 or 15 lessons a week, and sometimes someone calls me and they're like, I only have Tuesday at 8 o'clock available and nothing else. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I, I need a little more, more uh, leeway than that, and that's it. Like you, just, you may not be able to work it out. Um, Pros here, you get the most customizability. So you can just say, I only want to do math or verbal. You can say, I have a weak algebra background that was during COVID and I didn't learn any of it. I just wanted to do algebra for five or six lessons. That's totally up to you. And that's something you can do. You get more of that individualized attention. A good tutor will hopefully be listening to how you think out loud and be able to hear what you're doing right and wrong and be able to point out those things to you and identify weaknesses and things like that, which is harder to do in a class. And this is definitely the best for anyone that struggles with attention. It's the most active of uh, three because students should be talking out loud and solving questions, and the tutor is really just there to guide them. Totally different than a class. In a class, I kind of have to funnel people and just sort of tell them what to do and explain stuff. In tutoring, it's just like, okay, what do we do? And the student will be kind of running through most of that. So. This works really well for anyone that struggles with attention in a big class. Uh, I haven't had anybody fall asleep on me in tutoring yet. Maybe you want somebody to kind of like wink an eye or two, but uh, that was it. Um, so yeah, those are the main options. Whichever one you do, a couple of general guidelines you want to follow. Try to use the official study guides and tests. Like we said, there are four digital ones that are available on the College Board website through that Blue Book app. And sort of a secret fifth one if you take the digital PSAT on there. It's like an that's, um, they do have a bank of questions available on there as well as you can use. And if you exhaust all of that, you want more, you'll have to dip into a person or do a capital book or something like that. Make sure the practice you do is time. If you're doing those digital tests, the time before you, so you can't like not time it. Um, you know, you can always do like little batches of focused practice and just a couple 
triangle questions here and there, and you don't necessarily have to time that, but you want to make sure you've done time to practice before taking the real test. A good goal is somewhere between three to four, two to four full practice tests before taking the real thing. Not necessarily before the first time you take it, but that's where you'll start to feel like, okay, I've seen a lot now, I'm familiar with the test, and that's where you might start to see you get your best results. The big thing about practice, though, practice is really only step one. And I have to go over this with all of my students, and I get it. I was there once upon a time in high school. I got the work done, I handed it in, and that was it. But here, if you don't sit and go over everything you're getting wrong, like why am I getting this wrong, how do I get it right next time, you don't really get better. I mean, maybe you do a little bit, but you're going to hit a plateau if you approach your studies like that. So you have to be prepared to go that extra step. Wrestle with those explanations. Prepare questions for your teacher or your tutor or whoever it is you're working with and really try to keep learning. If you do that over and over, you will get better. As for reading, reading high complexity material can help. I'm a big fan of National Geographic. It's a great thing to incorporate into your life. Reading an article or two a week, three a week, whatever you can get in, uh, it definitely doesn't hurt. Maybe look up a couple words that you encounter in there and just keep trying to build that vocabulary. Uh, that you're going. Your goal will be to probably do about two hours of prep a week. That's going to be split between doing time practice and then actual studying of certain materials like uh, net formulas, grammar rules, and anything that you're getting wrong. So it's a bit of both, but you want to budget for that when you're ready to get started. A couple of resources we have here, the official websites uh, for SAT and ACT, collegeboard.org, ACT.org. Uh, we have the official books to study for them. Now, big disclaimer, uh, at first, I'm like, oh, they have, a, they have a new book. Let's use that for the digital SAT. That's great. The problem is the four tests in this digital SAT book are the same as the four online exams that they're putting out for free. And normally that would be fine. Like normally, like the paper SAT, they did that also. You could get them all online. But I'd say just buy the books. You don't have to print them. But now you want those four tests to take to get used to taking the test on the computer. You don't want to only practice this test in a book because you don't take it on paper. So this is actually a book that for now I wouldn't recommend to use. I would probably use a third party book. Uh, I'm using the Barron's book. I forgot the official name. It's just like look up Barron's Digital SAT. It's probably the first that pops up. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, the third party ones never are. I'm going to be looking at some other ones as we go. Probably I'll check out the like, Kaplan. But it's got a lot of good stuff in it. But from that, I want to do an actual test and get a feel for the exam. You're going to want to use the four online ones that are on the uh, Google book app. That's the best way to go. Khan Academy Network. Has anybody ever been on Khan Academy before? Great website. It's got tons of resources, questions, videos, and the official online SAT practice. That's a great spot when you want to target a specific topic and say, hey, I want to just hit parabolas today, or I want to do transitions. They'll have a batch of a couple questions, maybe a video or two. Uh, definitely worth exploring if you want more than just the uh, free online test. ACT's got something like that as well. I haven't been on there recently. I don't know if they've updated it much. It was okay the last time I checked. It's called openeds.com. So both have online free practice, which is pretty cool. Here's a bunch of dates and uh, times, which we don't have to go too much into, but if you want to see, uh, every test will have a registration deadline, which is not the true deadline. There is a late registration deadline, so they can make more money off of you. They charge you more if you do that. And for the SAT, it's actually only a couple of days after, which is weird. The ACT is a few weeks afterwards. And then you'll see the scores that will be available. Uh, big disclaimer. These might all not be right. Uh, they are as right as I can make them, but they may change, they might change. So definitely go by College Board and ACT website. Uh, do not trust this as the word of God because it could be uh, incorrect if they change anything on there. And that's pretty much it. Uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask at this time, whether it's about anything from the lecture or the ACT or anything like that? Tired going home. <laughs> 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 Any questions? Yeah, what do you got? So, if what the other book? No, good. Doesn't really help anymore. Okay. The, only, the only thing in there, I mean, I would, some of the math questions in there I actually found are in the pool of digital SAT questions. So the math isn't like totally useless if you want to just like practice, you know, extra questions. But uh, the verbal section is, is not the same anymore, so you can't use that. Yep, the new book. 
I had to retire my book there. I had worn down for almost nothing over seven years. Here in Hong Kong, I there's an SAT for us. Yep, there you go. <clears throat> yeah, you look in the newsletter, there's an SAT for us. For the digital? Because I know you did the... Yeah, I'm not sure if it's any different. I would have to call and ask. Oh, okay. So I would find, I'm going to find out. Hopefully it's different. I would hope so. If not, I mean, uh, I'm going to be designing a couple of courses. Like I run a course at uh, Malloy College for their review oh, course. So we're like revamping everything over there. So I'll have courses ready to go that I might end up running at some libraries nearby. Uh, you can always shoot me an email and you know, see yeah. what I have coming up in the pipeline. Um, I know like Connect Quads that they might be interested. Like they, again, everyone has like a couple of SAT courses, but they're like, we don't know if the teacher's learning right. the good stuff. So yeah. I'm like, okay, like I don't want to steal anything except for anyone's toes. But you know, if they don't have anything ready and you guys need something, I might be running some stuff. So yeah, yeah definitely should be aligned with that and update you know, on what's going on. Cool. Yeah. I do like the new test though. I, I think, um, I, I, I don't know how it's going to be for students. Like, uh, and I, I do like, it's a lot shorter, which is definitely better. Like the three hour test was long. Um, this one's still long, but it's not as bad. Um, I think what they're reading is really the part that's tough on the computer. Cause like before, like even on this test, like taking notes is a good thing to do. And like, you can't just write yeah. next to the sentence. The note thing is on there, but it's so awkward. Um, so I've just been like quickly shortening with a few notes, but I want to like summarize the sentence. You can't like really write, no. So the app's got a thing where you can like click and drag to highlight the sentence, click the highlight button, then you can add a note to it, and then it's highlighted, highlighted, highlighted and then you can hover over it to see your note, but it's so awkward. I mean, you've got like a minute. Question. You can't mess around. No, everything is all within this one app, so you can't do anything outside of the Blue Book app. No, we can only use whatever the Blue Book app lets you do. So they do have a tool. I recommend to check it out on the, the Blue Book app when you download it. So when you download it and you load it up, it'll say, okay, what do you want to do? It's got the four tests on there. I think it has something called a test preview tool. That'll be one of the options. It just lets you kind of play around with the going from question to question, marking answers. So just to get familiar with the interface. And you can try playing with the note taking highlighting thing to see how it feels, but I don't like it. I'm going to tell people just to write it. Yeah, it. It's called the Blue Book app. It's on College Board websites. So you go on College Board, you can type in College Board Blue Book app, and it should come up. Uh, but if you go into the College Board uh, website, anything about the digital SAT that says to practice or prepare, it'll have the Blue Book app uh, pretty prominently featured on there. Is there um, do you recommend that every kid takes the ACT and SAT? It's good to try both. Yeah, I tell everyone to try both. Um, in general, the ACT is a much faster test, so it's a bit of a different muscle. It's more of a sprint than a, than like a, a slow, a slow normal pace. Um, so anyone that struggles with timing might find the ACT harder. Having said that, I'll still tell people to try it because maybe it's easier for them and it kind of balances out. You just don't know until you try both. It's just another chance to potentially do well. And most colleges, pretty much all of them look at both tests in equal regard. It's not like they're going to say, oh, why didn't you send an SAT? They're both accepted. So it's just another chance to have a better score. You got nothing to lose other than a couple hours on Saturday, which I guess is, is something. But if you study for the SAT, does that help you on the ACT? Or there's a good amount of overlap. I would say the overlap is less than it used to be because of the verbal changes. So like the, the old paper SAT, was more was very similar to the ACT in terms of the long passage and questions. But now I feel like the verbal is like a different animal. So uh, you're still reading, you're still dealing with vocab. There's still similar types of reading questions. So that definitely does carry over. Um, the writing questions, there's a bunch that are still similar. Punctuation is huge on both of them. Transitions, verbs, but now like that research question, like that's not on the ACT. Uh, the which of the following is true would undermine the author's hypothesis. It's not really on the ACT. They kind of asked that, but now like the SAT is going to have like 48 of those. So now you're going to lose some of those like specific skills when you go from one step to the other. The math 
pretty much a lot of it's the same. There's more geometry on the ACT. And in general, the ACT goes wider on the mat, whereas the SAT might go deeper. And that could be good or bad. Like the ACT has a lot of random stuff that you might not see if you test the test. So you could look at 10 tests and then on two of them, they ask you to find the determinant of a matrix. And then you never see that question again. And it's just like a random thing you need to know. That doesn't matter for most students. If you're gunning for like the mid twenties, you don't need to know those super obscure hard questions. You just get them wrong or you guess on them. If you're gunning for above a 30, you now need to know all of this random stuff that they might throw at you, which is unfortunate. So um, if you struggle with like the memorization side of that, like formulas, there's a lot of that on the ACT. There's a lot of like area and volume. Uh, but if you're good with those, that could be the test of that. But the ACT is still on paper. Still on paper. They're talking about making a digital version of it that's optional. I can't imagine why anyone would elect to take that test on a computer if you don't have to, which is kind of insane. But they said that they're talking about doing that. I think they're in the process of maybe, it might have been the December, they might have done like a pilot, you know, let's, let's test this out and see how it goes thing. But for now, that test isn't changing formats. Um, they're not going to require digital as far as we know. So you guys should be fine for this in the next year for this run. But who knows? They also at one point said, oh, we're going to we're going to allow you to take some of the single sections again by themselves. And then they're like, no, no, no we're not going to do that anymore. <laughs> so like, I heard that. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You can go in and just take the math and then go home and then just take the reading. That would be, I've been wanting to do that for a long time. Even just for studying, you could say, I'm just going to study math. Take the math. Okay, I got my math score up. I'm done. And then they said, we're not going to do that anymore. So maybe it'll come back at some point, but for now, they take they that kind of money. Yeah. Is it true that they it would give you a better chance if it was scholarship or is it a... It's hard to say. I mean, I don't know necessarily the scholarships. I'm not sure about you have to kind of check from school to school. Uh, I know like the more competitive the school, the more likely you might want to have a strong SAT score. Again, that's a guidance counselor question. And even then, it's it's such a vague thing that they're kind of giving to us. So it's like, it's optional, but you should still send it if it's good. And so that's why I'm telling everyone, you know, whether you want to do any type of hardcore like tutoring or classes, just take the tests, try to get a piece of score, keep your options open, because if anything, it might only be able to help you if you get a solid score. Um, it's a weird thing. But they, they try to say it as like, if you put an application in front of someone, they only judge what's in front of them. They don't like look through the application and say, where's this? They just they look at what's there. So that's how they try to describe it. But again, it's just like, then like, if you have a good score, it doesn't like, give you the advantage over someone else. It's, it's great. Um, and all, I, all I can tell you is just from certain data that like at least about about half the students, maybe a little less than half, are still submitting scores. So um, it's not like everyone's just like, okay, that's it, no more scores. So again, I recommend to just take it and then you can always talk to your guidance counselor. It might depend on the schools you're looking at too, but some of them they might say like we're more strongly encouraging people to submit scores and you know, the ones that were test optional before this might even be more like we just don't care um some schools like in like california is trying to go test blind where they don't even let you submit a score i don't know when that's going to affect but like the whole california school system there's a chance it might be part of a like a plan to start to give their own state tests i don't know if that's actually part of it or not but they're trying to try to do it. We just don't want anyone to make scores at all. So, yeah, crazy stuff. Any other questions? Thank you. Anytime you guys have questions, the contact info is on there. Feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to try to talk you through, you know, what some of the options are. If you took some practice tests and just want to hear, you know, which score looks or sounds better, I'd be happy to try to talk through that too. Uh, if you ever look that up, it's called the uh, concordance tables or concordance is like, that's convert. You can just look up conversion probably, but um, I don't know. I haven't looked to see if they've actually updated it for the digital SAT. Uh, they actually didn't even update the paper one. Like when you look up the file, it says like 2018 SAT to ACT conversion. Like it's just, I guess that hasn't been good for a couple of years and they haven't updated it. 
but um, that's what I've been going by for a while. We'll see if they start to update that now for the digital one. But I assume since they said the digital receiver has correlate, that it's probably going to be pretty similar to that. Thanks for coming out.